So question five on additional problems, um, page 446, chapter 14. Uh, what is the resulting angular acceleration of a 1.7 kilogram forearm and hand when the forearm flexors attach three centimeters from the center of rotation at the elbow, produce 10 um, newtons of tension given 90 degree angle at the elbow and a forearm and a, a hand radius of gyration, uh, sorry, and a forearm hand radius of gyration of 20 centimeters. So let's just go through that again. It's pulling out things from the chapter before because you need to figure out the torque um, and uh, um, and adding to it the, the whole radius of gyration piece. Um, ultimately not that uh, difficult, but Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have a excuse me, you're gonna see more of the ceiling than me. Let me get rid of that. So we have a forearm hand and it's going to rotate around that elbow. It's got uh, um can't see your screen. You can't see my screen. Well, that will that would do it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, nope, that's not what I want to have done. Just going to stop sharing for a second. Sharing the whiteboard. There you go. Okay, forearm and hand, and uh, the uh, it's got a weight. Um, I'm going to do the free body diagram. You don't need to do the free body diagram at this point, but I always like doing a free body diagram. So. Um, we're going to have the weight due to gravity. Now, we don't actually know that we have to worry about gravity in this question, um, and it doesn't really matter. It honestly doesn't matter because, um, well, let me ask the question. When wouldn't you have to worry about gravity? Um, well, it's not an object in space, but I guess if you consider in the transverse plane, then you don't have to consider gravity. Exactly. So you can either think of the arm as being down here, in which case you would have to worry about gravity. Not that you not have to use gravity in this particular question. Or um, you have it here and you don't have to worry about it. So let's assume that it's in this plane and it's 90 degrees, in which case we won't worry about gravity. Um, and we'll just have our two things and we're going to have the force of the biceps that we are going to assume is attaching at 90 degrees. Um, and that is going to be a um, 10 Newtons. We know that this distance is three centimeters. So we know that the sum of the torques equals mass, uh, sorry, that is just, I, I, I could do the whole thing, but I won't. I will start with I alpha. Right? Some of the torques equals I alpha. And again, just this is chapter 14, additional problem five. Um, 
And so we have the torque being created by the uh, uh, um, muscles around the uh, elbow. So let's start with I. I equals mass times radius of gyration squared, which equals 1.7 kilograms times radius of gyration, which is 0 0.2 meters squared. Now, when I look at my forearm and hand, let's just remind ourselves, can you actually see what the radius of gyration is? Uh, not really, because it's not the center of gravity. Exactly, it is a uh, it, it is a uh, distance that is that if all the mass was there, then it would rotate the same way. Well, that's not easy to find. That's not something you can take a tape measure and measure. You have to have calculated it using things. Um, anthropometric measures are often used for finding the. Uh, uh, radius of gyration of a segment. So 1.7 kilograms times 0.2 meters squared, anybody? 0 0.068 kilogram meters squared. 0 0.068 kilogram meters squared. And we are told that the, uh, um, Well, now we want to find the torque because we're going to take our torques around here. So we don't have to worry about these joint forces because they have zero moments arm. They're not going to create a torque. The torque is being created by the flexor muscles is 10 newtons times 0 0.03 meters or 0. 3 newton meters. We're all good with that? Did my math right? So if we rearrange this equation, because what we want to find is this, alpha is going to equal 0 0.3 newton meters. And, and again, if, if we did it in the um, sagittal plane, um, we would have had to use the the torque being created by the gravity and um, that won't work. So we, we clearly have to be in this plane so we're not worrying about gravity. Divided by 0 0.068 kilogram meters squared. Well, let's just take a few seconds to think through the uh, units here. Um, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And uh, so times meters divided by kilogram meters squared. Well, that leaves us kilograms are gone. The meters squared, we'll get rid of those two. So we'll be left with per second squared. And that's, again, why we uh, angular velocities in this type of equation has to be radians per second squared because if we had put radians per second squared into this equation the radians would drop out and uh, if in this particular case the radi because we're calculating the angular acceleration um, the radians come back in. So 0.3 newton meters divided by 0.068 Kilogram meter squared? 1.41 radians per second squared. 1 1.41? 4, 1. 4.41. 4 4.41? 4 okay. Uh, radians per second squared. We all agree with that? Or I'll go with that? Any questions on that one? Again, I can't see chat when I'm sharing the screen this way. Um, it just takes up too much space to have it up there. So unmute and talk to me. 
Yeah, it's just about the the sagittal plane because I think that's what tricked me because I consider the torque of the arm as well, and it doesn't make sense if you're looking at through the transverse plane. Exactly. Yeah. So it ha it it has to be up here, so you're not worrying about uh, gravity. Um, you're absolutely right that if we were looking at it in the sagittal plane, I you, there would be a torque created by the weight here. Um, um and we would have to know the distance this distance in order to do that and we'd have a very different torque um because the sum of the torques would include both the the uh, forearm flexors and the weight but because we think of it in this plane we can get rid of of that And you know, they aren't clear about that, but that's the only way you're going to solve this problem. Okay. So nobody has any other questions on that one? No, much. I have a question. Okay. Um, I, I haven't watched the lectures yet, so I just wanted to ask, how do you know that there's no gravity in the trans, uh, transparent? Trans uh, transverse? Yeah, sorry. I just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, hey, even after being awake, it's, it's sometimes easy to, to mix uh, those. Well, the reality is there is gravity. The gravity just isn't in the for the flexors. Um, and it actually would have been, I think, in the gravity, center of gravity lecture that I talked about it when you don't have to worry about the center of gravity and it would be space or if you're looking in something in a, um, from a view where you don't see gravity. And um, so basically, if you're looking from above, if you're looking from above, you don't see gravity, right? You can't see gravity because gravity's going this way. So you're basically seeing, it would be like looking at the end of the pen, right? Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You're looking at it from up, up top. You're looking at it from up top. So, and, and that, if you think about it, that is the view that I've got um, uh, in this in this diagram here is 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 from on top and uh, so you do not see gravity in that one they should have been more specific um i think um so that you know that you don't have to account for for gravity in the question you know looking at it from from above uh, for a action that's in the transverse plane something like that but uh, um, that uh, they didn't and this is the this is so that's how we can solve it and and get this solution if okay. yeah. if we were looking at it in the sagittal plane you'd have to um, take into account uh, um, uh, gravity and your sum of torques would include both the torque from the muscle and the torque due to gravity or and, yeah both torques and you you'd add one and subtract the other and so that you would get uh, um, clearly if you put the same muscle torque in here versus the same muscle torque in a in here, you're not going to get the same acceleration. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this one? Okay, do you have any other questions, Amos, or is that to uh... Um, well, I think the idea is like similar for the following additional problems. I'll just have to go through them on my own time. Um, yeah. and, and you can come back to them next week if, if, yeah, if there's any that you have a question for. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I'm 
going to choose one then because we we didn't do a lot of these ones because they weren't going last week because they weren't going to be on the midterm. Um, but I'm going to do chapter 13 additional problem uh, three. And again, for those who joined, I'm sorry that that one lecture has been taken down. It is going to be up hopefully again this afternoon um, in rendering it. For some reason, the slides didn't appear in the corner. So I just wanted, I didn't want you to waste time doing it without being able to see which slide I'm talking about. Um, but it will be coming back. And this is based on that lecture, equilibrium at the joint level. So um, if we do, um, chapter 13, additional problem, additional problem three. Why do I want to do this one? I want to do this one because I hate this question and I wish they would take this question out of the textbook. The reason I hate this question and want this one out of the textbook is because you can do it wrong and get the right answer. Um, they have everything at 45 degrees, which mean you can use sines and coses um, indiscriminately and get the right answer because at 45 degrees, sine 45 and cos 45 equal the same thing. So whether you, uh, whichever one you used, uh, you would find it to be correct. Um, or if you didn't use sine or cos at all, because all of them are the same, the muscle is the same as both of the, um, uh, both the, the two weight ones, um, because they all are the same, um, they all have the same either sine or cos 45 in there, they cancel each other out, which means if you completely forgot to use the sines or coses, um, you would still get the correct answer. And, and then you might think in future ones that you can do it without the sines or coses, and you can't. Um, so that's why I, I, this is not my favorite question and it's good to go through it. A 35 Newton hand and forearm are held at 45 degree angle to the vertically oriented humerus. The center of gravity of the forearm and hand is located at a distance of 15 centimeters from the joint center at the elbow and the elbow flexor muscles attach at, at an average distance of three centimeters from the joint, centimeter, joint center and assume that the muscles attach at a 45 degrees to the bone, meaning they go straight up parallel to the humerus. So we do start again with our free body diagram. We have our forearm and hand, and we have a weight here um, and we have a weight due to the center of gravity there. So we, we'll just use their nomenclature weight A, weight B, which makes sense because that's the ball. We don't show the ball in this free body diagram because we've replaced the ball with the uh, weight of the ball. Um, which is actually the force of the ball on the hand. Um, we have the force of the biceps. And to be proper, we would have the two joint forces here. Again, as we talked about last week, we know that there's two forces there um, of the humerus onto the ulna. 
we don't necessarily know exactly which direction they go, whether it's up or down or uh, right or left, but we know that there's the two components there and we would figure it out um, using the sum of forces. And if we, if we put them into, the, uh, into our equations of motion, equation of motion is a fancy way of saying the sum of forces equals mass times acceleration sum of torques equals I alpha. It's, it's just a fancy way of saying that. Um, so if we put them into that equation using our reference frame, um, and we end up with a, so we put them in based on the uh, combination of the direction of the arrow that we drew and the reference frame. So for example, um, I have put this, the vertical force pointing up, which means I'll put it in as a positive when I do the sum of forces in the y direction. And I've done the force um, in the x direction to the right. So I also would put it in the a positive going in this equation. Um, if I had drawn, let's say, the joint force in the y direction down, um, I would have put it in negative when I do my sum of forces in the y direction. I would include that in, in a negative direction. And um, just to, to follow up on that, if when I solve for my force, not that we're doing that, um, but uh, if I solved for a uh, solved for my joint forces, um, again doesn't ask for it. But uh, if I solve for it and I got a negative value, I wouldn't change it. I would just say, um, let's say I got a value of negative a hundred newtons. Um, I would just say, you know, the the vertical force on the joint is. Uh, 100 newtons acting in the opposite direction from where the arrow is drawn. It's very, very simple. Or is 100 newton, negative 100 newtons, which implies that it's 100 newtons in the opposite direction from how I drew my arrow. Um, we don't... Because human movement is movement and we're changing all the time, we kind of create a standard free body diagram and then it can change back and forth as we go through the movement. You see that in the graphs of let's say muscle torque over time um, where sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's the flexor, sometimes it's the extensors we go through. We don't keep changing the direction of the arrow that would have uh, that we would have put on the free body diagram um, for the torque at the elbow or torque at the knee or torque at the hip. Um, we just change the sign of, of what it, what we are, uh, of what the answer is. If it's positive, we are going in the direction that we drew the arrow. And if it's negative, it's in the opposite direction from when we drew the arrow. Okay, so that, uh, soapbox that doesn't really have to do with this question, but it's a good time to talk about it. Um, okay, so we know that the distance from here to there is um, 15 centimeters. And for the second question, from there to there is 25 centimeters. Again, for part A, um, the ball isn't there but I'm, I'm just drawing the comprehensive uh, free body diagram that has both. Um, weight A 
equals um, 35 newtons. Weight B equals 50 newtons. And <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is an equilibrium problem. So we can go with the sum of, and, and this is the elbow right here. Well, I'm just going to call that E. Sum of torque around the point E which is the center of rotation of the elbow equals zero, meaning we basically are isometric. Um, there is no, it's not that there's no movement, but there's no angular acceleration. Remember, because if sum of torques equals I alpha equals zero, the I isn't gonna be zero. So that has to be zero, the angular um, acceleration has to be zero. And uh, now that can either mean that um, we're in an isometric contraction or we have a slow rotate. You know, if we're doing things slowly, we can call it in, um, in biomechanics, we call it a quasi-static um, situation where uh, it can be assumed that the angular acceleration is zero because our range of motion is such that there is only so far you're going. You know that you're going to have to accelerate up and then decelerate to stop so that if if this if we are doing something fast, it, it's pretty much it's very difficult to imagine a situation where we would do something fast, where we could hold it at a constant velocity, angular velocity for very long. We only have a short range of motion. So if we're starting from zero and we're ending at zero, it means that there's that it pretty much is a, a ramp up to speed and a ramp down from speed, which means you'd have an angular acceleration. But if we're doing something slow, we can probably hold that angular velocity um, for a while. So we call that a quasi um, quasi static scenario if we have it. So and the code words for that type of question would be somebody is doing a slow movement or we know for a fact if they're holding it in place and isometric, if somebody is uh, holding in place um, and doing this, then we know for sure we have a, a uh, an equilibrium problem where the angular acceleration is zero. All the accelerations are zero. So the sum of the torques around the elbow are zero and, and read this question. We're doing part A here. How much force must be exerted by the forearm flexors to maintain this position? So you're trying to hold the arm at 45 degrees in place. Um, so no accelerations. That's an equilibrium situation. So now we need to find um, the torques of initially just FM and the weight of the arm, because if you read A, how much force to hold it in position, that's before you add the ball. Part B is after you've added the ball. So just you have a torque created by the force of the muscle and you have a torque created by the weight of the arm. Why don't you have a, a torque created by the two joint forces? Uh, wouldn't the moment arm be zero at the joint? Exactly. That's exactly right. So the, the joint forces we don't have to worry about because they have a zero moment arm at the joint, which is one of the reasons why we're taking our torques around that joint center, which we can do in an equilibrium scenario. It becomes a little more difficult. So you, you really have to do it around the center of gravity um, for a full... Um, dynamic 
scenario, but in an equilibrium situation, we can do it anywhere. So we're going to choose the elbow because A, it wants us to, to do things around the elbow. It gives us all the information around the elbow. And B, we don't have to worry about those joint forces because they won't create torque around the elbow. Okay, so let's look at each one of those forces. Um, here's the force of the muscle. Um, there's the, uh, uh, the bone. And we know that this is three centimeters. And that distance right there is the moment arm. This is 45 degrees. Um, what is the moment arm? Sine cos. in this particular situation. Would it be cos? As I've drawn it there, yes, it will be cos 45. Now, if you wanted to do it with respect to the actual, um, um, so as I've drawn it there, it will be cos 45, which is again why I don't like this particular problem because um, sine, and, sine 45 and cos 45 are the same thing. Um, sorry. Yes, it does. Sorry, that took so much out. But if you look at it from the perspective of if I did it this way, and I had the angle of attachment, I was given the angle of attachment. Um, if that was 45, then this one right here would be 45. And the one that we would be using would actually be sine. And since we're often given the angle of attachment, um, that one maybe is more appropriate to use the sine 45. In this particular case, both work and it just has to do with what angle you um, put in your drawing. But in this particular case, uh, or it, um, it, so often we are using sine because if, again, if you wanted to look at it um, another way would be to find your um, rotating component, in which case uh, it would be FM times sine 45, which would be your rotating component, which you would then multiply times your moment arm. Either way works. Um, it's just the fact that, uh, so realistically, Sign is probably a better, more consistent way of doing it if you're given angle of attachment, right? Um, it's uh, the, uh, but in this particular case, sine and cos are the same thing. If I had, if this was not 45 degrees and we had been given, let's say an angle of attachment of 30 degrees, then in this particular case, this um, that would be 30 and the uh, uh, where I kind of drew this little X thing would be 30 and we would have 60 here. So it would be cos 60. So that would work. Um, but uh, again, probably best to use sine in general because that is that gets you that rotary component if you're given an angle of attachment. And again, both work in this problem because uh, just depending how you drew your triangle, because sine and cos are the same thing at 45 degrees. Now let's look at our two, uh, at our um, 
joint or our weight. So our weight is coming down here. This is, um, again, that arm is 45 degrees. We're told that it's 45 degrees there. That is actually the angle we're given. Uh, well, no, actually it isn't. To be honest, this is the angle we're given. We're given the angle with respect to the humerus. Um, so this angle is going to be 45 degrees because 90 minus 45 is still 45 degrees. We know that this distance right here is 15 centimeters. So this moment arm for A, um, so this is the moment arm here of the muscle. The moment arm for A is going to be 15 cos 45, right? Again, it's whichever angle you showed or how you drew your, your thing. So I'm going to have, if I come here, the muscle is going to rotate again. Hold your pen at the elbow, push in the direction of the muscle and it happens to turn counterclockwise, which I consider positive. If I push down, it's going clockwise, um, at least with respect to me pushing down, it's clockwise. Um, and and I, you have a pen or pencil with you when you're doing these things, so you can do that. So I have FM times 0 0.03 sine 45. And that's gonna be plus because it's rotating counterclockwise with respect to me. And the other one is going, oops, yeah, minus um, weight A, which is 35 Newtons times, um, sorry, 0 0.15, should be point, cos 45. That's gonna equal zero, sorry, that goes, that equals zero. Uh, we can rearrange all this to solve for the force in the muscle is going to equal 0 0.03 sine 45. Oh, sorry, take that back. Um, I apologize. It's going to equal 35 times 0 0.15 cos 45 divided by 0 0.03 sine 45. That's in Newtons. This is in meters. This is in meters. They're going to cancel. So we're going to be left in Newtons. And that is well, it'll be 35 times five, which I think should give us the 175 Newtons. So if you had done this problem and you hadn't put in sine or cos at all, it wouldn't have mattered because that would have, those two would have canceled each other out and, and you'd still get the right answer. But you'd assume that that's how you do all problems, and it isn't the correct way to do the problem. You have to have the correct sines and coses in there, um, and it's not always going to be 45, and they're not all always all going to be the same angle, which they are in this particular case. So um, I just want you to uh, recognize that. Um, somebody had a question. Connor, is the question about this? So I, I did uh, solve this one, but uh, I didn't use cos and sine. And I was, and I was just curious about why um, the way that I did it is I did three uh, FM is equal to 35 multiplied by 15 and then rearranged and got the 175. Yeah. So you did exactly what I showed here where you got rid of those. Yeah. And 
and you got the right and 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 you will get the right answer and that is why i hate this question <laughs> which is why i started with that is because it it doesn't teach you that you really a torque is a force times a moment arm and 35 times 15 is not the moment is not the torque being created by the weight it's not the torque being created by the weight that is this distance times this force and uh the uh it works in this question because um the angles are the same for both so what happens if you would have got the wrong answer wrong if for example uh, let me just clear some of the board here so that um, it becomes a little more apparent. What happens if, and it, this isn't how this problem is worded, but if this problem was that um, the arm was being held at 45 degrees to the, uh, uh, to the vertical, not, not to the humerus uh, that the in, in this particular question the humerus is straight up and down and the arm is 45 or the forearm is 45 degrees to the humerus but if you ignore the what's happening here with the humerus piece and just say that this is at 45 degrees sorry shouldn't be an elbow or an arrow there that should be a uh, forearm and hand so it's still at 45 degrees but in fact, the humerus, which we are, don't see it and we wouldn't include in the free body diagram is like that. So that would be the example of me holding my arm straight out, my upper arm straight out like this, and then my forearm and hand 45 degrees to the uh, horizontal. But uh, it, that would actually be 135 degrees for between the humerus and the forearm if I was had that um, example, then I would have my um, muscle force going out at some angle here. And let's say that angle attachment was uh, 38 degrees, or well, let's just go with 40 degrees. If that, you know, that angle is now 45 degrees, I now have this guy, which is 45 degrees here. They, there is not going to be the same, uh, I'm going to have sine 40 um, for, if I just change what was happening here. I'm now going to have um, for my, this guy is still going to be um, cos 45. That's not going to change. Um, but this guy is now going to be sine 40. Well, cos 45 and sine 40 are not the same thing. And therefore, they will not cancel. And you're not going to get 175 Newtons anymore. You had to have included the, the effect of the angles in, in, your, um, in your answer, or you would get the wrong answer. Because it's, again, it comes right back to this. It is the sum of the torques, which means you have a force and you have a moment arm and the moment arm is not that distance for the muscle or this distance for the, uh, which is what you had done. And, and most people do, a lot of people do it. Um, and, that, and that's why I wanted to go through this question because I don't want people to think that in the future, in another problem with different angles, that they can get by with using, um, you know, 15 as the moment arm for the weight of the arm and 
three as the moment arm for the um, force of the muscle because we know the moment arm for the force of the muscle um, again is uh, would be the the horizontal distance from here to there and the moment arm for this weight is the horizontal distance out to the line of action of the muscle that is what a moment arm is and it's the moment arm that you're multiplying by the force not the distance of attachment basically so for um for what you're saying is is to take the the 15 centimeters yeah and because that 15 centimeters is the horizontal distance you it, use no it's not the horizontal distance it's the distance along the bone okay yeah um and so that because that is oriented in that way it's coast 45 which is sine. yeah okay and then the other one isn't along the bone so it's sine uh it's still along the bone but the angle that they technically give you at both either sine or cos works it depends on how you draw the draw the uh, um draw the diagram since they're very specific to say that the um that the muscle attaches at um, 45 degrees, I think. Um, that the muscle attaches, that this angle is 45 degrees, which is not the angle of attachment. In fact, the angle of attachment is 135 degrees, but hey, um, they aren't always consistent. Uh, so they do say that that is 45 degrees. So um, the only reason we use sine is because what they give us is the angle be between the muscle and the bone. They don't give us, they don't necessarily, we can infer from that because that means, again, this is the line of action of the muscle. This is the moment arm. We know if that's 45 degrees, this has to be 45 degrees, which means this has to be 45 degrees, which, and this is 90. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you might not figure out what I'm doing there, but I hope you can. So either sine or cos works because the, uh, um, be depending on which angle you chose. If you choose the angle of attachment, which is the angle they give you, um, then you use sine. All right. But again, the reason this works is because even if you have cos 45 on the top and sine 45 on the bottom, Sine 45 and cos 45 are the same, right? 45 degrees is that unique point in the middle between 0 and 90, halfway between 0 and 90, and it's the one place where sine and cos are identical. Right. So the reason that this works is that they cancel out. Yeah. Uh, so if you know, like, if you looked at this question and, like, you were a math minded person you, and you realize, hey, Cos and sine 40 or sine 45, they're going to cancel. I can omit them. Yeah. But otherwise, otherwise don't do that. Yeah, exactly. But if you're, if you're not a math minded person and you solve the problem without the sines and coses and you get the right answer, then you think you can use that approach in the future and you, if for every situation and you can't. Okay. I understand. <laughs> The, and, and as a math-minded person, I will say that if I was just looking at the 45-degree uh, piece, so if I, if I actually had it as um, sine 45 and cos 45, the technically correct place, uh, uh, certainly the one that uh, will make sure you get full marks in a question like this, to cancel the sine 45 and the cos 45 is at this point in time. Um, so I have it like this and I can immediately say, okay, I'm going to cancel those two because I know they're the same. I've, I've written them in, so I've demonstrated that I know they have to be there. Um, but now I've canceled them because I've demonstrated that I know they're the same. 
and I can, and, and at this point I will automatically, which is what I did in my head. I said, oh, three divided by, or three into 15 goes five times. So this is five times 35, which is what it is, which is where you get the 175. So again, when you're talking about math minded people, you, you would put it in there and then just cancel it um, as opposed to not putting it in there at all. Any other questions on this one? If you're wondering with part B, where we actually add the weight in there, we are now going to have, uh, so this is part B, um, we're gonna have FM times 0 0.03 sine 45, minus, oh, sorry, 35 times 0.15 cos 45 minus um, 50 times 0.25 uh, times cos 45 equals zero. So FM is going to equal 35 times 0.15 cos 45 plus 50 cos 45 divided by 0 0.03 sine 45. And the same thing happens. You can cancel something out as long as as long as it's in every um, entity that is added or subtracted together um, on the top. So I can now go, oh yeah, that one's there and it's also there and there. So you will still get the correct answer if you don't put the sines and coses in, in this particular case, just because they cancel each other out, not because they shouldn't be there because they should be there. Any other questions on this one? Again, unmute and, and ask if, if you have any questions on that or have I pretty much made it clear why you have to put the signs and coses. Good. Okay, we will clear that board and stop the share. Um, Aaliyah. Hi, Dr. Moore. Um, I just I had a quick conceptual question from lecture, I think 16. Do you mind going over like, how do you know which way the, um, I guess like whether the force would be directed clockwise or counterclockwise? Cause I'm confused. Would you hold the pencil um, at the center of gravity or like at one end? Good question. So basically we're talking the torque ones, right? The force translating into a torque right? The, the rotational effect of a force. Um, and, and it'll be like the, uh, um, the kid climbing the wall. One uh, example. Um, I'm guessing something like that. Uh, let me just again, share our whiteboard. So Let's say I have a calf and foot. I'm just going to go with the calf and foot for a change. Calf and foot. And I have a force due to gravity of the due to the weight of the calf and foot. And maybe I have an ankle weight on here that has a force due to gravity. Um, and then I have a quadriceps force here. And 
And then again, we might have these two forces here. G might Y, F joint X. Okay. This is my knee. If I'm taking, and I have, of course, my reference frame. If I'm doing an equilibrium problem, I'm going to choose a any point. I can choose. I can choose any point along that leg to, to, to take my torques around. And often we do it around the... Uh, the the knee even some of the dynamic problems that you'll see in the in the next chapter where we do the sum of torques equals i alpha we'll do it around a joint and the um and the i is associated with the um moment of inertia around the joint um so and i'm going to choose around the joint because then I don't have to worry about those two joint forces because they're creating no rotation around my knee because they have zero moment arm at the knee. So the only three forces that I have to worry about around my knee are the sum of, uh, is the force of the quadriceps, the weight of the calf and foot, and the weight of the weight on my ankle. Um, gets even more complicated if I was using, let's say, a, a, a piece, an exercise machine, in which case the force on my foot might not be straight down, it might be an angle, you know. Um, and anyway, so I want my sum of torques around my, sorry, not elbow, knee. <laughs> Done too much around the arm lately around my knee and, and let's say it's it's an equilibrium problem so that's zero so i can take it around any point when i do that um i want to see which direction the force in question is going to rotate the uh, the the calf and foot around the knee so if i held literally held my pencil and I can't really show it to you this way but if I held my pen the end of my pencil right there uh, right right here over top of my um, uh, the top of my sorry I'm holding that pencil right over top of my um, knee just holding it there. And then I push in the direction that the, uh, um, the various forces act. If I pushed using this guy, it's going to rotate that way. That just happens to be counterclockwise, which is what I consider positive. If I, so I'm trying to get this way. If I push on using gravity, hopefully you can see that it's going to rotate, rotate this way, which would be clockwise. Same with this guy. If I push down on it at the end here, it's going to rotate clockwise. So each one of these has a moment arm. Um, this is the moment arm for the quads. That is the moment arm for the weight of the uh, um, calf and foot. And that is the moment arm for the uh, um, weight at the ankle. So if I did my sum of torques, I'm going to, um, it's going to equal the force of the quads times the moment arm of the quads. 
And that's going to be positive because, as I said, that rotates around counterclockwise. And then it's going to be minus the weight of the calf and foot um, times the moment arm of the calf and foot minus, um, again, this would be moment arm. I didn't actually label all the other ones, but minus the weight of the weight times the moment arm of the weight, which all equals zero. Does that help? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. Um, so just to follow up then, when we looked at like the example and lecture of a person, like I understand with the segment, you usually would rotate the forces about the joint. But if we're looking at a person with like multiple segments, um, would it be safe to assume then that you can rotate at the center of gravity? Absolutely. So even with this segment, I could have chosen to take my torques around the center of gravity. And there are reasons to do torques around the center of gravity if you've got a highly dynamic situation. So if you're studying somebody kicking a soccer ball where you've got, you know, quick accelerations of the uh, around the knee, then you actually in that case would be better served for various reasons somewhat beyond this course to actually take your um, torques around the center of gravity of the calf and foot. Um, if I did that, so let's just uh, redo this guy. Um, I'm going to have the same forces. Okay. If I did my some of my torques around the center of gravity. Now, again, in an equilibrium situation, you can take them around anywhere you'd like. As long as the sum of the torques equals zero, you can use the, the knee, the center of gravity, the big toe, whatever you'd like. You usually choose the place that makes life easiest for yourself. So if I was taking it around the center of gravity, um, then I would have, I would have the quads and the moment arm for the quads would be, is going to be there. And I have the force of the, in the X direction at the joint with a moment arm there. And a force of the joint with a moment arm there. And the force of the weight with a moment arm there. Um, if I do that, then again, now I'm going to hold my pen this way. And the force of the quads is up. So it's now actually going to try and rotate it uh, clockwise because I'm holding it in the center. If I push up in that direction of the quads, it actually is going to rotate it um, clockwise with respect to um, my uh, center of gravity. So I would actually be putting in negative force of the quads times, these are new moment arm. So with respect to the center of gravity, um, I've got the force of the uh, joint. Again, it's going to uh, rotate around clockwise. Um, times uh, the moment arm of the uh, joint in the X direction with respect to the center of gravity, um, plus the for force of the joint 
in the y direction, so y really is, times the moment arm of the joint in the y direction, c of g. So if I chose, if I was taking my torques around the center of gravity, again, if I push down at the, uh, there, you can see that it actually rotate it, hopefully, you can see that it rotates center, it rotates counterclockwise. So it would be a positive. And the one down here would also rotate it uh, counter, or sorry, clockwise. So it would be a negative. Um, so negative um, force of the weight, or sorry, weight, weight times the, moment arm of the weight with respect to the C of G. That all equals zero. So if I, you know, I, if I chose to take them around in the center of gravity, I could. And I would have to hold my pen in the center, at the center of gravity, and then push up and push down, depending on where the forces are, to decide whether it's going to rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and you can see that, that it will actually change some of the, uh, the signs here. The quad sign is now going to be a negative sign instead of a positive. The, the, the torque created by the quads would now actually be negative, not positive, because it would, if you do that, it would, uh, it would try to rotate it at clockwise, which, um, we've saying are negative. You can also see why we never do this um, because now uh, you don't have to worry about the weight, the overall weight, the overall center of gravity force because it has zero moment arms. So it will have no effect in terms of rotation. But you do now have to worry about those two joint forces. So those are two forces that you probably don't know it, what they are at this point in time. Um, so you you the uh, um, you would need to include those joint forces in into this equation now because they actually have a rotational effect around the center of gravity. But uh, so there are times when you use center of gravity. When we look at the whole body, we probably are doing um, center of gravity um, of the person. Um, we don't have to worry about the joint forces in that one. So it makes sense to do that. And again, if it's a dynamic situation, so if it equals uh, I alpha, if there is an actual alpha there, um, you do. So if you actually have an, a significant acceleration, um, both linear or, or angular of your body in question, whether it's the whole body or whether it's a body segment, um, then you do, there are ways to take it around the a, a point other than the center of gravity, but you have to add a whole bunch of other things and that's well beyond this class. And I, I'm not teaching you that. So um, that that's, does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question on this? If you do, just unmute and ask. Okay, I will clear it then. And Elena. Do you have a question? Yeah, me. Can you hear me? Oh, now I can hear you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, good morning. So I have a question. Not not about this. I have a question about levers. Levers. So okay. if we uh, have a concentric contraction, for example, for biceps. And um, okay. So this is uh, and around elbows, so this is uh, third uh, class lever, right? Because we have force. Yep. Uh, force of muscle. 
So it's in not a it's, it's it's a third class lever in that scenario. Yes, in third class. Hmm? And if we have eccentric contraction, like uh, so, it's the second class lever. No, for the for elbow, right? Well, it, 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 like depends how, it depends how you look at it, but if you still consider the, I mean, it, it, to be honest, the switch between a third and a second, um, what the difference is, is what you consider the applied force and what you consider the load. And as far as I'm concerned, when I'm looking at it from the perspective of a body, the applied load is what I, as the body, the human body, not, not the generic uh, um, a body at rest or a body in motion. Um, but it, in the case of a human body, I consider the applied load the muscle because that's the one they're controlling. That's the one that you are putting on in response to the other one. And if you ask me, um, if you're putting it on with respect to the other one, then the other one is the load. Um, and the the applied force is the... Uh, um, Applied force is the uh, um, applied force is the muscle. So, regardless of whether it's concentric or eccentric, um, it strikes me that since you're turning on the muscle to control the other one, mm -hmm. uh, the other force, that that still is applied. So it still would be a third class lever. There is dispute on that. I'm. I won't. I won't. Uh, um, since the muscle is losing in an eccentric contraction, um, mm -hmm. so if I'm pushing down on my hand, and um, so this is applied force, right? In that case. Well, that's what they, uh, there are people who would say that uh, if you're a pu a pushing down to um, overcome a muscle force, that this would uh -huh. be the applied force. And, and, and again, it's a, it's a bit of semantics and it's, a, uh, um, it's, it's very much how you think of it. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. actually put a question like that on because as far as I'm concerned, no matter what, if I'm pushing down on my hand slowly mm -hmm. in, in a way that I want to control and, and do it slowly. So I'm doing a, I don't have a weight with me, but I'm doing a slow biceps curl, the second part of it, the back down part mm -hmm. of it. So I've gone up mm -hmm. and I've come back down. Why is the weight in my arm less uh, um, the load going down than it was going up. It was the load coming up. It's still the load that I'm controlling going down. The fact that I'm controlling, uh, the fact that I'm turning on my biceps to control its descent still mm -hmm. means that I am applying a force to control mm -hmm. its descent. So I personally consider it a, a third class lever both ways because in both directions, I'm the one who has to choose to apply the force to um, uh, keep going or to, to control what's happening. If I, mm -hmm. didn't, if I didn't turn on my muscle, it would just do that, right? It, 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 if, you, you know, if you ever have a chance, pick up a weight and do a slow lower portion of the biceps curl and just turn off your biceps and, and your... Mm -hmm and your forearm just falls. So uh, to me, the force that the human body has to put on to control the motion makes it the applied force. So, and, and in both cases, um, whether I'm going up or whether I'm going down or whether I'm doing something isometric, um, in, in all three of those cases, um, 
the muscle force that I have to generate is going to be significant in most cases and for for this except for maybe up close here but as i lower it down the muscle force that i whether i'm lowering it down or whether i'm raising it up the muscle force um that i'm applying is going to be greater than whatever the weight is in my hand um and that's the disadvantage of the third class lever is that you have to apply more force than your um than the load and so to me i have to apply more muscle force uh whether i'm slow lowering my arm or whether i'm raising my arm i still have to apply more muscle force um which again is the you know if you want to think of that of your arm as a lever system um then that fact that it's a third class lever um lets you understand that you need to have so much more muscle force than you do um than than the load so from my perspective up or down it's third class lever but in the down case that there are people who may um, dispute it in depending on how they would look at it. But from my perspective, I consider the muscle as the applied force because it's the force that you have to put on to control um, the movement. That help? Again, it's it's a gray area, but as far as I'm concerned, it's it's third class both directions. I don't always agree with uh, um, with uh, Miss Hall, Mrs. Hall, Miss Hall, but <laughs> fair enough. Any other questions? I have time for one more quick one before I, yes, Amos? I'm not sure if it's so quick. It's the last example on, uh, uh, what is it? Lecture 17 with the frictional components of a sprinter. The last example on uh, lecture 17, the frictional components of the sprinter. Yeah. Um, let me just, uh, I think it's slide 37. So we're talking, And the question just simply says, why don't we include the other four forces? But which for um, remove the number? What is the the name of the lecture? Oh, uh, equilibrium whole body uh, level. Oh, okay. That's that's what I needed to know. Sorry. Um, I'll just bring up the. Okay. So this one, right? This is correct. Yeah. So we, uh, why don't we include the other four forces? Uh, so we're looking at the sum of torques around a uh, uh, Z, point Z, which is the uh, um, ground, where the ground touches the uh, uh, back leg, right? And if I look at those torques, 
I don't use force um, A, B, C, or A, B, C, or E. I do use D, F, and the weight of the whole body, uh, the rotational effect of those three forces. I do not, I'm taking torques around point Z, which is on the ground um, at the back foot. So why wouldn't I include forces A, B, um, again, excuse my C and E. Well, for A and B, that makes sense to me because there's no moment arm. Um, C and E, I'm not sure if this, I'm getting this correct, where that's like the frictional component. And since we don't have a acceleration, then nope. we don't. They could be there. We could be pushing back the other way on one. One of those could be negative and one of those could be positive and cancel each other out. So that you, let, let's say you're pushing so that um, uh, C, I, I'm going to say I'm not a sprinter in any way, shape or form, but let's say I was pushing with C um, in a forward direction and I was my um, E, my hand one was in the opposite direction. So it was actually a negative value. Um, and then I remove my hands then I'm going to accelerate. I've already generated the force. You know, I don't start, start uh, generating the force before I take off. I've already started creating some, some push force, um, but I'm counteracting it with my hands until the gun goes off. So it could be, it, it could be there. No, what's the moment arm for those two? Draw them straight back to the point of. Uh, oh, because uh, <laughs> you're assuming like a flat ground, right? Yeah. Okay, I, I get it now. Then. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, yeah, it all comes back down to torque is a force times a moment arm. <laughs>